Welcome to another edition of Drugs, Crime, and Politics, brought to you by the Drug Policy Forum of Texas. Good evening. I'm your host, Buford Carroll. With me tonight, we have Clayton Jones, as usual. Good evening. And we're honored to have Dean Becker of the Drug Truth Network. And Dean is just back from uh, the normal conference in Portland, Oregon, and is going to share some information from that conference as well as other information with us tonight. Uh, I might start out first with an announcement. Houston Normal will have their monthly meeting tomorrow night, Thursday, at 7.30 at the West Gray Cafeteria on West Gray Street, a couple of blocks east of Montrose in Houston. So be sure and drop by and find out what Normal is doing this month. A uh, couple of interesting bits of news. The first is the FBI has just released their compiled uh, arrest statistics for the year 2009 and in particular looking at the drug arrests. Uh, supposedly drug arrests overall are down, but marijuana arrests are up and now constitute over 50% of all drug arrests in the United States. Total drug arrests in the year 2009, 1,683,000. Total marijuana arrests, which were over 51% of the total, 858,000. Marijuana sales and manufacturing arrests, 99,000, and that was 6% of all drug arrests. Marijuana possession arrests were 46% of all of the drug arrests and were about 760,000 overall. That's I think that kind of says the American public has quasi said that we don't care what the government says, we're going to do this, it's less harmful to us. Well, I've been saying for a couple of years now that the people have legalized marijuana yes. and the government just hasn't caught up yet. That's it. But, yeah. Well, it, it, it speaks to what's going on in California. I mean, I want to show you the headline of this. I hope you can read it. It says, All Eyes on California Voters, which is uh, very true. It's in... Um, Nearly every publication around the country and heck, around the world, they're talking about what's going on in California, what it might portend for the other states, for the rest of the world. And that's the vote in November on Proposition 19, which would legalize uh, possession and sale of marijuana under state law. Yeah, yeah. One, one ounce uh, in your possession, no more than a 25 square foot growing area. Yeah. Uh, which uh, would suffice for an individual person, I, I, I'm certain. Um, the, the, uh, the noise, if you will, from this is, is uh, encouraging lots of folks to stand up either on one side or the other. The group Law Enforcement Against Prohibition, my group, uh, my band of brothers, if you will, are standing pretty strong. Uh, judge James P. Gray, now a retired Superior Court judge out there, has been speaking rather boldly. Um, uh, Norm Stamper, former police chief of Seattle, and uh, many others are, are standing forward. And uh, earlier this week, there was a major press conference, and uh, about 12 uh, newspapers and uh, other uh, broadcasters captured that, put it on the air, and talked about that need for change. Well, and, go ahead. A couple of things that have uh, caught my attention about it, Dean. The first is that, uh, as you mentioned, newspapers across the country, but also the broadcast media. Television, both broadcast and cable, uh, have carried a lot of coverage of the issue. Yes. And uh, it's been surprisingly <clears throat> neutral uh, or even favorable with right. the coverage. Yeah. And I think what surprises me even more is that the only federal official I'm aware of that has spoken up about the California issue 
is Senator Feinstein from San Francisco who is opposed to it, but she's been opposed to drug law change for forever. But I find it surprising that uh, the other members of Congress, uh, members of the executive branch, even members of the DEA have been remarkably silent over this issue. Right. The, uh, the situation, I, I think, is, uh, I don't know, enhanced, really, uh, by virtue of the fact that starting in January, Washington, D.C., our nation's capital, will have medical marijuana uh, yeah. distribution yeah. Uh, right there in, in, the, in the capital. I think I mentioned a few weeks ago that one of my favorite daydreams is <clears throat> January the 1st. For the head of the DEA to look out of her office window, and there right across the street is a big <laughs> neon sign for a medical marijuana, marijuana. <laughs> <laughs> that, that would be a sweet picture, yes. The legalization, if this happens in California, it's going to have far more reaching effects outside of our country. Mexico says, Calderon says he's going to start looking at outright legalization instead of just personal amounts. Well, if we look... <clears throat> at the situation in Mexico, uh, which frankly is disastrous. The problem in Mexico is that one of their top three sources of foreign exchange is drugs. And the U.S. drug market adds about 30 billion, that's with a B, mm -hmm. each year to the Mexican economy. Roughly half of that comes from marijuana. If we have legalization in just a couple of large states in the United States, virtually all of that marijuana money disappears. And if you take away half of that 30 billion, there's a whole lot less left for the cartels to fight over. Mm -hmm. And let's face it, the cartels don't give a damn about drugs. They only care about they money. Only, they're in it for money. And if you take the money away, there's nothing left for them to fight for. Plus, I think that our border would be a lot more safe if marijuana was produced right here in this country. Uh, we, you, they were just having a firefight day before yesterday on the... Across the border. Across the border again. Well, for one thing, uh, and you and Dean can speak more to this than I can. If California legalizes, uh, with the position California holds in American agriculture in general, mm -hmm. they're not going to keep that legal California marijuana in California. And there's no way that the Mexican cartels can compete in terms of price or quality either. Right with domestically grown marijuana from California. I mean... Well, domestically this, grown California marijuana is already shipped all over the country. Oh, yes. But it'll go a lot easier. Uh, oh, yes. You know, once it's legal. Uh, it, I, I, you know, you were talking about uh, the media a while ago. I, I saw an extract, uh, I, I can't think of the Friends of Fox or something, uh, Judge Napolitano, he was interviewing... Uh, um, Rob Campia and another anti-legalization guy. And it seemed that this Judge Napolitano, a Fox commentator, uh, could have joined law enforcement against prohibition. He was calling uh, uh, the, the drug war, not just the marijuana laws, an abject failure. Um, you know, while I, while I was in uh, uh, Portland, I, I went to uh, this new, well, it's relatively new uh, club, if you will. It's called... Uh, world famous cannabis cafe. Yes, and they they have a structure whereby you have to first be a member of Oregon Normal, then you have to have a doctor's recommendation. Right. Then you can for a hundred dollars you join this uh, this organization, the no. world famous cannabis cafe, and then each time you come in, you give them five dollars. Yeah. They give you a joint. They let you use the the uh, volcano vaporizer. They, they have hash oils and other products which they share with their members yeah. of this world-famous cannabis cafe. In other words, they cannot sell you the weed, but they can give it to you if you're a member. Right. Yeah. And uh, there are hundreds of people. It's a gathering place for growers, uh, providers, if you will, and uh, for the patients to meet up 
and uh, you can have no more than five patients per grower, yeah. and this is one of the places where they find one another. Well, you know, this, and this is something that I think both you and Clayton can speak to. Uh, 14 states plus the District of Columbia right. have now approved medical marijuana within their states. But the problem is that only New Mexico to a small extent and Maine with their new system has made any provision in their laws for the marijuana to get from the seed to the patient. I believe Rhode Island should be in there also, shouldn't they? Uh, they've made some recent changes in their law, and I'm not really There's sure. three organizations that are uh, charged with dispensing or the dispensaries, and they're allowed to grow their own. Okay, but, but you know, it, it strikes me as funny that we can say it's legal for John Doe to have marijuana for his MS or whatever. But then say, but by the way, to get it, you or your representative still got to go out on the street corner and buy it from a crook. Right. Yeah. That, that just doesn't make sense to me. No, it, no, it makes no sense. Um, you know, there, there were several doctors out there. They had a, a medical marijuana day, in fact, the last day of the normal conference. And uh, one of those who spoke was uh, Dr., uh, oh, I'm thinking of the wrong guy, uh, Mitch Earlywine. Uh, he, he spoke, and I, I got a chance to do a film with him. Would you care to see that uh, at this time? I would love to see an interview with Mitch. All right. Uh, yeah, it's about six, seven minutes. Okay. I, I think you'll really enjoy it. Okay. And I don't... That means Steve. Okay, we've got There it. we go. Dr. Mitch Earlywine, uh, who came here to tell us some of the new truths that are being revealed about marijuana, medical marijuana. Mitch, uh, what, what topics are you bringing to this conference? My focus today is really about post-traumatic stress disorder, a disorder that's affecting a lot of our veterans. This war has gone on quite some time and we've seen a lot of folks suffer. We have some preliminary data suggesting that cannabis can help with some of the more severe symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder, particularly those related to sleep. So problems uh, with sleep are common with this, and cannabis certainly seems to help. Mitch, uh, there are so many other areas of uh, medicine, if you will, where discoveries are being made or where other applications of medicine are uh, proving possible or even beneficial. Yeah, your thoughts. The beauty of the cannabis plant is that it contains so many unique compounds. So we have cannabinoids that we know very little about in there, but we're discovering they have incredible antioxidant properties, meaning they have potential to preserve nerve function, help ourselves work as optimally as possible, and just make sure that we're not wearing ourselves out biologically through all the stressors we take on in our daily lives. The potential is so vast, unfortunately, prohibition has impaired our research on this topic here in the U.S. and other countries are actually getting ahead of us, finding new things about THC, finding the cannabinoid receptor. All this work is happening overseas and we're genuinely behind on this. I look forward to seeing a change in cannabis laws so that our physicians, our medical researchers can really make the progress that this plant definitely needs. Mitch, I observe, I, I pay very close attention, you're probably aware that uh, many studies are being released, many uh, reports are being issued by you know valid medical bodies and, and concerns around the world on an almost continual basis and all of them disproving the government posture, 
if you will, the government representation towards uh, marijuana, what's it going to take? I, uh, today, the economist says the drug war is an abysmal failure. What's it going to take to shake the politicians or to awaken the people to take another look? I think what's happened with cannabis prohibition parallels some of the things we saw with alcohol prohibition. It's suddenly dawning on us that the laws have more negative consequences than the plant. Here we really do need the economics behind this. A tax and regulated market in cannabis could provide astounding amounts of money, truly marvelous amounts of resources for all kinds of research, treatment, prevention, and programs in areas that have nothing to do with cannabis. Nevertheless, folks are afraid because they've been misinformed. I feel like education is the answer, and as we train more and more people that cannabis doesn't create negative consequences we thought it created, we'll suddenly know the change in this laws is inevitable. I'm noticing that in the media in the last 10 years, rather than being asked, what are marijuana's medical benefits, I used to get asked, does marijuana have any medical benefits? And we're seeing this change gradually, but it's really, really happening. I used to get asked, why would we possibly legalize? Now I'm asked, what are the potential benefits of legalizing? And over the years, as the media has changed the way we frame the question, we're finding the answers become more and more obvious that a change in cannabis prohibition is going to benefit us all. Yeah, any particular website you think folks could uh, benefit from visiting? I always love to see folks go to normal.org, that's N-O-R-M-L dot O-R-G. You'll see some updates about some of the greatest work around. I feel like there's still some myths that are frightening the American public about cannabis. First and foremost, cannabis does not cause aggression. I'm stunned that there's still people out there suggesting that this is a possibility. Second, but equally important, cannabis is not a gateway to heart drugs. Literally, hundreds of millions of people use cannabis and never use hard drugs, much less use them problematically. As more and more people understand this, our fear of cannabis is going to decrease and we can spend a lot more time focusing on our laws on the things that really matter rather than busting people for owning a plant. Law enforcement against prohibition. These men and women have served in the trenches of the drug war as prosecutors, judges, cops, guards, and wardens. They have seen firsthand the utter futility of our policy and now work together to end drug prohibition. Please visit leap.cc. Doug, that... Er Dean, that was very informative. Uh, yeah, it's it's uh, it's interesting when you get out there and you you deal with these doctors and scientists that have yeah. been devoting their life, their focus, yeah. to this one plant. Yeah, and and they have uh, really a lot to offer. Well, I he he mentioned exploring other uses, and frankly, I've been thinking about one lately. Uh, back in its first medical life. When cannabis was a legal medicine before 1937, uh, one of its primary uses was as a remedy for PMS and for menstrual cramps. Those are problems that we still have and they're still hard to handle. The second life of medical cannabis from the middle 70s has concentrated on hard, big, scary stuff. Cancer, HIV, hey. MS. Uh, and the problem with concentrating on big, scary stuff is that we get the idea that something that's really good at handling big, scary diseases is kind of big, it's scary itself. It's too big for small stuff. And that's the other side. And whereas most of us know or have a relative that's died of cancer 
And we think about it, it's not something we see in our everyday life. But if we, if we started looking at, and I'm just asking the question, I, if we started asking, does this really work for PMS? We could get a whole lot more people mm -hmm. on our side saying, <laughs> let me use it. And it would also be something that's not quite so big and hairy and scary as a cancer drug. Can, can I tell you one uh, of the panels okay. out there that really caught my attention? It, it was, uh, 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 they were speaking of people, um, the, the reverse gateway, if you will, yeah. that cannabis was useful for people who are alcoholics yeah. or hard drug users to step away from that more deadly yeah. or combination yeah. of use to something that was less problematic. And of course, I, I this past uh, May 8th, made 25 years, I have okay. been without alcohol. And uh, I believe I owe that to uh, the use of cannabis. And they, they now have Alcoholics Anonymous groups that allow people to use cannabis and to talk about <laughs> it within their meetings. Okay. Well, I wanna, I wanna follow up on that, but let's take a little break first. All right. It's time to play Name That Drug by its side effects. Swelling of the tongue, decreased bone marrow, fever chills, infection, nervous system degeneration, confusion, loss of consciousness, fatigue, memory loss, muscle weakness, numbness, tingling, seizure, speech disturbance, cancer, and death. Time's up. The answer, Levamisol, a dog dewormer that has become America's number one cutting agent for cocaine. This week in drug war history, September 16th, 2003, Seattle voters approve Initiative 75, which instructs local police and prosecutors to make adult marijuana possession their lowest priority. September 17th, 1998. 93 members of Congress vote yes in the first vote on medical marijuana to take place on the floor of the House. September 17, 2002, Santa Cruz, California officials allow a medical marijuana giveaway at City Hall to protest federal raids. September 20, 1999, the public is finally informed of the results of Washington, D.C.'s Initiative 59, the legalization of marijuana for medical treatment initiative of 1998, after Judge Richard Roberts allows the release of the tally previously suppressed by Congress. Voters had supported medical marijuana by 69 to 21 percent. September 21, 1969, in an attempt to reduce marijuana smuggling from Mexico, the Custom Department under Commissioner Miles Ambrose launches Operation Intercept, subjecting every vehicle crossing the Mexican border to a three-minute inspection and to many observers marking the beginning of the modern war on drugs. The operation lasts two weeks and wreaks economic havoc on both sides of the border, but fails to seriously impact the flow of marijuana into the U.S. This is Steve Nolan for the Drug Truth Network. You're watching drugs, crime, and politics. <laughs> Welcome back to Drugs, Crime, and Politics. I'm here tonight with Clayton Jones and Dean Becker. I want to remind everyone that this is your program. We are happy to get your uh, comments and questions. You can call us at the number on the screen if you're watching us live, uh, if you're watching us either uh, on the internet or on YouTube, you can send an email to the address on the screen and I'll answer you and we might uh, use your comment or question on the next program. So be sure and join in and help us make it your show. Uh, we were talking about some of the, the broadening research in the use of marijuana medically. I, I, I want to share something with you. Uh, a few weeks back, I guess it's been a couple of months back, I heard from a good friend of mine, Howard Wildridge, yeah. You guys know him. Oh, he's yeah. trying to, yeah, he's oh, a great guy in California. Oh, oh, caller, good, good. Hello, caller, you're on the air. Uh, I have a question. Okay. If California passes the law here in November, uh, how fast do you think uh, it would spread uh, throughout the rest of the country? 
Okay. Massachusetts is looking at it now. Uh, Massachusetts has a bill pending in their legislature. Uh, it's been buried under the news about California, but Washington also has a referendum mm -hmm. on their ballot in November. Uh, several states are talking about it. Uh, Dean, you talk to more people nationwide. Uh, I, I, I think it's going to light a fire, uh, not just in the, the yeah. people, but also uh, in the eyes of other politicians to see yeah. that, the, one, uh, the world doesn't end, that uh, California yeah. is able to meet some of their financial budget problems, yeah. and that, um, in general, it's just not going to be the fiasco or, or the problem that these, uh, well, we were talking about it. The people that are against this Prop 19 in California, uh, amongst them are the liquor lobby, who donated only ten thousand dollars? Buford said that's not much, and it's not much for a liquor company to but give. It shows intent. Shows intent, yeah. but it also shows uh, the fact that they're disregarding the fact that alcohol is some several times more deadly, uh, dangerous <laughs> to the individual than is cannabis. But I, I think the caller is right that it is going to begin the process. Mexico may legalize it Mex next. Mexico is yeah. thinking they can't legalize drugs until the United States does. So it, it, it <coughs> might create an international shift in uh, well, perception there. You know, it would be interesting if Mexico legalized drugs. That would mean that the Mexican police would have no reason for going after the cartels for trafficking. They would still be able to go against them for murder and violence. Right. But it would certainly tone down the level of violence. So might make some interesting changes in Mexico. I could still see the cartels battling out for who, who controls that. Who gets that, the biggest uh, share. Uh, yeah. But, yeah. Who controls yeah. the plaza, the, the funneling yeah. of these drugs, because yeah. that's it's still yeah. going to, even if the United States legalized them, they still have Europe, they still got the rest of the world well, as a black market purchasers the, where the price would be higher. The problem is Mexico would be cut out of the loop. European cocaine is going from Colombia, normally through Brazil or Venezuela, yeah. to Nigeria, and then mm -hmm. up through Spain. Right. So if Walgreen were importing cocaine directly from Colombia and leaving Mexico out of the process, True. if the marijuana were grown domestically instead of in Mexico, if the heroin were brought directly from Afghanistan or even made locally, then Mexico is pretty well cut out of the drug trade period. Right. Uh, if you drive, I think, I think well over 90% of that $30 billion a year in Mexico would disappear if the United States repealed drug prohibition. Mm -hmm. I, I have no doubt you're right. Yeah. The, 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 the truth being that, yeah, the domestic marijuana could be easily grown here. Yeah. I think uh, San Ho Tree said that the total acreage needed to grow all the coca necessary to supply the world can be grown in an area of 40 by 40 miles, well, roughly the size of the city of Houston. Well, there, there, are, there are farms in Texas that have more acres than that in them. Well, sure. sure. I, I grew up in, in West Texas where we grew cotton on five and 6,000 acre farms. So. Right. Wow. And, um, you know, in, in so far as the, uh, the opium production, I mean, uh, it's not, you don't need uh, some strange country or some foreign soil. It can grow anywhere. I've recently been tracing, and in one 1878 report of the Massachusetts Board of Health, they reported commercial opium growing in the United States in New Hampshire, Florida, Louisiana, Arizona, and California. During the Civil War, the South, which was subject to a horrendous sea blockade, had to grow all of the medical opium its armies needed. I found several reports from the later 1800s where women would tend to say a fourth of an acre plot outside their kitchen door and grow enough opium to meet their own needs. I mean, 
Right. It grows everywhere in the world. Mm -hmm. So. Well, you you think of the the vast waste of yeah. of effort and money and manpower and lives. Yeah. Uh, chasing this dream, this pipe dream, actually, <laughs> that, that we're going to stop the flow of drugs. It's, uh, it's just preposterous. Never happened and never will happen. No. For, uh, you know, the, there's a story, I, I, uh, I think you guys saw it too, came out today. Can I read a little bit yes. from it? This is coming uh, from a Fox affiliate, uh, Trophy, Texas. Administrators at Byron Nelson High School in Trophy Club suspended a 16-year-old boy on Tuesday because his eyes were bloodshot and they thought he might have been smoking marijuana. The teen said he was not high, instead his eyes were red because he was grieving the loss of his murdered father. Uh, his father was stabbed to death uh, on the Sunday, two days before he was uh, admonished for red eyes. Uh, his mother said he wanted to go to school. She got a call from the administrators who told her that Kyler would be suspended for three days. She was pleading with them to understand the severity of the situation. They, uh, the administrators wouldn't discuss the subject with Fox, but they, when they suspect a student is under the influence, a school nurse will observe symptoms like behavior, odor, and their eyes. They don't actually test students, no, though that's left to the parents. Kyler was allowed to return to class after he showed school administrators a copy of his negative drug test results. This is another example of hysteria leading the way, isn't it, Buford? Uh the old army saying was never fear never doubt if you don't know just scream and shout flail your arms and run about and <laughs> so much of what we do yeah. in drug law is we don't know nothing so we <laughs> scream and shout and flail our arms and run about I, I, I like to use the phrase that these drug war politicians uh, may not be a doctor but they love to play one on TV well <laughs> if, if we look at, at drug testing the typical drug test cost a school about twenty to thirty dollars. Most of the time when schools do drug testing, they come up with about one percent positive results. That means that they wasted the money on ninety-nine tests to find one that shows a positive result. And Several studies have been done over the past decade comparing schools that test with schools that don't test, and they find no discernible difference in drug use at either school. So, and, and what's even worse, uh, and, and I've got analysis of this up on, on my blog, the t statistics say that even if you have a 99% accurate test, which is more than any of these damn drug tests, and you're applying it to a population that's only, say, 5% users, you're actually going to have more false positive results than you have true positive results. Well, Quest uh, Laboratories is now trying to push for hair, uh, hair tests. Because they're more reliable and they, they no, show... No, they're, they're not more reliable. What they do is they show a longer history. Right. Uh, let's take another break and come back. Uh, they cost about twice as much. some brilliant entrepreneurs came up with the idea of blocking the endocannabinoids in our body to create a new diet drug. The theory being, if cannabis gives people the munchies, then blocking the endocannabinoids would make them lose their appetites. The drug they developed, Ramonabont, did indeed reduce appetite by blocking the endocannabinoid receptors. But data from clinical trials showed that Ramonabont users suffered depression, anxiety, insomnia, and aggressive impulses at twice the rate of subjects given a placebo. Well, Sanofi Aventis, the company that had, had developed and was marketing this agent, did not study people with a history of psychiatric illness or depression before they applied for approval. That was probably a mistake. The EMA did approve it, and the drug's been on the market in Europe for a year, a year and a half by now, 
And I've, I've sort of said, if there was any real problem with this that was more than just theoretical, we would know. Well, it turns out we do know. And they've, they've suggested now that the risk for this agent is, outweighs the benefit. In one study, there were five suicides among Rabonabont users because, as they discovered, endocannabinoids are also mood regulators with the capacity to make us feel euphoric or, when blocked, depressed. Ramonabont was finally withdrawn from the market in 2008. Researchers at the MD Anderson Cancer Center in Texas reported that mice and Ramonabont developed potentially cancerous polyps at a far higher rate than controls, confirming that endocannabinoids are not only mood regulators, but tumor regulators as well. Good evening. You're watching Drugs, Crime, and Politics on Houston Media Source. Well, welcome back to Drugs, Crime, and Politics. Uh, with the talk in that break about uh, anti-tumor effects, we have to get in a little bit of dig here. The first medical paper indicating anti-tumor effects of cannabinoids came from a 1974 symposium that was held in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. The results were published in a two-volume set of medical papers. And I dare you to find one in any but the most extremely good libraries because the conference was sponsored by the National Institute of Drug Abuse. They rather quickly after that recalled all of the printed books and they're almost unheard of now. About 10 to 15 years after that, a Spanish university replicated the studies, citing the 1974 cool. American studies. And most of the current anti-tumor research has been based on those Spanish studies. Uh, does Dr. Manuel Guzman, he, he has spoken a couple of times at the uh, Patients yeah. Out of Time yes. uh, gathering. Yeah. Um, and and the, the, the sad thing is, is that this, uh, the studies that the, you just saw the example of here showing that it uh, um, helps lessen the instance and growth of tumors. Yeah. And in certain cases, especially glioma, uh, a brain tumor, yeah. Uh, it actually has been shown to shrink or even to uh, eliminate those yes. those uh, tumors altogether. And uh, normally glioma is a very fast-growing, uh, typically terminal type yeah, of cancer. It's, it's hard to manage any other way. I mean, with gliomas at the base of the brain and glial cells mixed in with neurons, it's surgically very hard to treat and it's resistant. You can't use much radiation on it because of its conjunction to the brain. Uh, it's resistant to a lot of the anti-tumor drugs, so it's 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 a baddie. Oh, this so. is so true. Now, uh, you know, again, I showed you this at the beginning. This yeah. uh, West Coast Leaf. It's available out there. They sell uh, uh, several or give away several hundred thousand copies of this each uh, quarter. And uh, there's a story down here that kind of refutes much of what the drug czars have been saying that, you know, marijuana leads to emergency room visits, uh, it means it sends more people to treatment. But they're talking about here, lifetime use of marijuana is rarely associated with emergency room visits. Uh, and this according to uh, an article published online by the American Journal of Emergency Medicine. Um, as, as an example, uh, it says that a uh, representative of 43,000 uh, residents that 1.7% uh, reported lifetime use of tranquilizers and inhalants were more likely to go than uh, those using uh, cannabis, that it's just so rare that it's uh, way under 1% mm -hmm. of the, the emergency room visits, though, again, the drug czar actually does make a living lying. He has to refute or deny any discussion of legalization. It's actually in his contract to make sure that the truth of this matter is never uh, allowed to right. be brought the forward. Law, the law that created his office specifically says it's part of his job to oppose any proposed laws that would weaken the drug laws. Uh, 
I've talked to some emergency room doctors, and they say that there are a few, very few cases of people who come into the emergency room because they're using cannabis. That this is almost always the form of a rather mild anxiety or panic attack. Mm -hmm. And the therapy they give them is to put them in a quiet, somewhat dark room and leave them alone for about 30 minutes. Maybe a sandwich. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Or a bag of potato chips. Well, and, uh, you know, uh, a, a few months back, uh, Jack Hare, the emperor yeah. uh, uh, wears no clothes author, uh, passed on. And I had a situation one time where I was interviewing him. This has been now three, four years ago. Yeah. Uh, he was in his hotel room, and where, wherever Jack Harrow went, especially at these conferences, growers followed him. Yeah. And they had a bag of their very best, and the next guy would have his best. And, yeah. and each person would uh, pass a joint, and each one would say, now, here, try this, Jack. Well, I'm interviewing Jack, and all of a sudden somebody passed me, and I took a hit, passed it on, and I remembered as I blew the smoke out, it was the whitest smoke I'd ever <laughs> inhaled. And, and about three minutes later, it was like I was leaving the room. And I, I left the room. I told Jack, I'm going to have to do this later. I got about 100 feet down the hallway, realized I had had my first panic attack. Mm -hmm. I was lucky in that I knew there was such thing as a panic attack, and it immediately took the fangs out of it. I yeah. turned around, went back, knocked on the door, and finished the conversation. But I could see where that could be frightening to a novice yeah. in particular, right. could, could perhaps lead them to an emergency room. But the fact of the matter is, just knowing that there is such a thing as a panic attack, as I said, it, away. Yeah. It, it made it go away for me. Well, it, it reminds me of something else, a related uh, story that's come along. Uh, a study was released this last week about the use of psilocybin, which is the active ingredient mm -hmm. of magic mushrooms. Sure. Mm -hmm. uh, in grief counseling for people with terminal diseases. Uh, to anyone that follows the medical side of this, that's old news. This dates back to the middle 50s. There's a, a fantastically good track record of using psilocybin, LSD, and MDMA all for this. Well done. And it made the network news. Two different news stories I showed both of them, they had the network medical consultant expert mm -hmm. who treated this as, yeah, very matter-of-fact medical story, probably something there. We need to do more study. It looks good to us. But in both cases, the so-called professional journalists were just all a flutter and about, wow, that's, that's an illegal drug. That's bad stuff. It can't be medicine, can it? I mean, people have become so propagandized over the whole idea of evil drugs. Well, and journalists, truthfully, have become so lazy yeah. in, in that they, 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 uh, they take a study that's presented and don't do any further well, investigation to determine how true or I'm, I'm not it going to, to come down and say they're lazy. Part of the problem is if you look at the heyday of American journalism, the 1970s, Places like CBS, New York Times, Washington Post, the old Christian Science Monitor spent millions and millions and millions of dollars fielding large teams of investigative reporters, having extensive research bureaus, fact checkers. And in the past 30 years, they've cut down their overhead and you've got a journalist doing probably three or four or five times as many stories mm -hmm. as his counterpart would have done 30 years ago. Mm. He's doing them on the fly. He's got no chance to do research. He's got no one in the newsroom backing him up. Uh, it's a case where the system has cheapened itself to the point where they're just not able to do the job they used to do. And then, of course, you've got things like the Fall News Network <laughs> that doesn't even try. But, but in the ones that are legitimate, it's, they're just stretched too far to do the job right. Uh, no, I, I would agree with that. I would agree let's take that. another break and see you in a few minutes.
hotel scrap Hello cool They thank us for our silence Each year's hundred billion dollars And the chance to do it forevermore Drugs, the first eternal war Cut me loose, set me free Judge what I do, now what's inside of me Why do you pick my pocket? Just let me light my rocket Who made you the boss of me? Get out of my life Let me be If they stop Afghanistan Colombian cocaine When Mexico runs out of marijuana They think we'll quit getting high But Walgreens is always standing by Cut me loose, set me free Judge what I do, now what's inside of me Peasants in the field Let's stand for truth or forever new Every 16 seconds We hear the slamming door And we owe it all To eternal war The first Eternal war <laughs> Been there, seen the shirt. <laughs> yeah. And I believe the, the symbol that ended that break is the same one that's on your stomach right there. Right, right. Uh, uh, let's see. It, uh, at the top here, WW Infinity Squared. And around the circle here, it says Drugs and Terror, World Wars Forever. Drugtruth.net. And uh, a quick plug here for what I do. Right. I produce now 10 shows per week for. Uh, 91 affiliate stations, U.S. and Canada. I'm based here at KPFT, the mothership of the Drug Truth Network. And you can tune in uh, Sunday nights for the half-hour show starting at 6.30 Central. And that's at 90.1 FM in Galveston at 89.5. And, uh, you know, you can check it out uh, online. There's hundreds of our shows at drugtruth.net. This, this coming week, we're going to have more segments from the normal conference, including uh, probably that the audio from that sec section you just saw with Dr. Mitch Earlywine. Okay. Uh, I think Dean is actually selling himself a little short here, because in addition to producing these shows and serving as the host and interviewer, he also spends an inordinate amount of time on the road, attending conferences, meetings, going around the world talking to people and seeing what's happening. Uh, well, thank you, Buford. I, you know, the, the, the point being, I'm one of, I would say, a thousand people who kind of do this, I'm not going to say for a living because it sure don't pay, <laughs> but, uh, but who do this. It's, it, I call it the mashed potato syndrome. If you think yeah. of that movie, Close Encounters of the Third Kind, and people 
making uh, representations of, uh, you know, the Devil's Peak or piling it in the living room or drawing it on the wall or whatever. It's a compulsion. It's a need. It's a sense that this madness has got to end. And uh, you, you guys have a, uh, the same bug. I know that. Wow that uh, we want to leave something a little better behind for future generations, something that makes a little more sense. Uh, but I, I, I also get to speak for law enforcement against prohibition. I mentioned earlier yeah. my band of brothers. And uh, I've spoken to various colleges, uh, uh, fraternal organizations, churches, uh, you name it. And uh, Clay and I even had a chance one time oh, yeah. To talk, school. <coughs> to talk to normal at St. Thomas High School. Mm -hmm. We were invited to share the unvarnished truth there, and uh, I wish more high schools would invite us because that's where kids need to learn the truth. We don't want kids doing drugs, and if they do, we certainly don't want them doing these uh, concoctions made by untrained chemists and yeah. cut with household products sold right. in back rooms and alleyways at a 17,000% markup. You know, I've, I've been noticing all of the hysteria across the country about so-called spice and K2, yes. these mm -hmm. supposedly artificial marijuana, and everyone's all in a flutter because students are going to get it. Uh, and I notice it sells for about 30 bucks a gram. A lot more than regular weed. A lot That's more than regular weed. Yeah. And if you're worried about kids taking untested <coughs> chemicals, there's a damn simple way. Legalize weed and that'll run K2 off the market in a hurry. I've got a friend who was a high school teacher. Yeah. And he says there is never any problem with marijuana, cannabis, in school. No. The problems he has is with pills. He'll have a student come in, and he can see him getting going, going south through the course of the class. They keep him in their the pills in their pens. Well, there was a, there was a little bitty short note in the paper this morning about an FDA panel that refused to remove cough syrups like Robitussin that contain DXM from over-the-counter sales. Uh, DXM is the active ingredient in Robitussin and several other over-the-counter cough syrups. It's an hallucinogen. Kids have been using it to, to trip on for decades at least, and it's one that causes several deaths a year. So they can buy it in the convenience store over-the-counter but marijuana is illegal. I see who's on the phone. Hello, caller. You're on the air. Yeah, hi. Uh, I had a quick question. Okay. Uh, I mean, I heard you mention the artificial marijuana. Has there, any, has there been any test that it's harmful to the body? Okay. So uh, it's never been tested on humans. We well, uh, hold on. Can I? I have yeah. tested it. Okay. Uh, I, I, uh, I heard about it uh, a while back. I went to a local... Uh, well, let's just say a vendor. Yeah. Uh, they gave me two different samples. One was spice, one, and the other was called K2. Yeah. Uh, one was uh, supposedly 30%, the other 40%. And what it is, they take this, uh, oh, guy, I, I can't remember the product. It's, it's a non-toxic, non-psychoactive uh, herb, and they spray this uh, liquid yeah. on it uh, in and, and some certain ratio, and that's, that's scary enough in itself. I, I smoked it. I... <clears throat> felt it was uh, somewhat akin to smoking marijuana, but it also gave me a headache and it was very, very rough on the lungs because of the, the, the stuff it was sprayed on or perhaps it was the chemical itself, but it certainly wasn't pleasant and the gentleman told me that it uh, typically sells between 20 and $40 a gram. Uh, not worth it by any stretch of the imagination, oh, yeah. not for the price, not for not knowing what is contained therein, and uh, you know, there is a better product. It's called cannabis. Well, I, I would answer in two ways. The supposed active ingredient in K2 is a chemical that was developed by a chemist to use in testing cannabinoid receptors in rats. He did not design it for use with humans. It has never been tested in humans. The inventor himself says, I don't know what the effect would be. Uh, I suspect it's safe, but there's no testing at all on it. 
The other side is it's mixed with potpourri or sachet, the stuff your grandmother used to put in her underwear drawer. <laughs> no one knows what kind of weeds and plants and garbage are mixed yes. into that. Exactly. Or what happens to anybody if you smoke it. So I would say stay away from it. Caller, you're on the air. Hello. Hello. Do you have a comment or question? Oh, thank you. Um, yeah, I had a question regarding the... Uh, you might turn your TV down. Oh, that's what I was just doing. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, what I was going to ask was, have you done any kind of a stats on legalizing uh, pot versus the cost of incarceration, prosecution, blah, blah, blah? <laughs> Like in California, they sell it and pay taxes on it, and they raise revenue. Okay. Thank you. Uh, there, good, good question. I would say probably Jeffrey Myron, uh, uh, an economist on the faculty at Harvard, has done the most studies on the costs of enforcing the drug laws. And, and the benefits through taxation. Yeah. Uh, we do know that on an average... It costs between twenty-five and fifty thousand dollars a year to keep a person in jail or prison. As we mentioned uh, earlier, seven hundred and fifty-eight thousand arrested each year for mere possession of marijuana. Do the arithmetic on your own. Well, the, the, that's one of the points that yeah. these uh, uh, yeah. uh, say yes to Prop 19 mm -hmm. folks. Are, are talking about that yeah. that for every arrest uh, and, and certainly every yeah. e incarceration it means another teacher gets a pink slip you know yeah. for for every yeah. uh, instance of um, you know trying to yeah. enforce these laws you're taking away you know maybe the the uh, mm -hmm. the Saturday hours on a library for every one of these arrests where we're shorting ourselves in being allowed and allowing our police forces to go after more dangerous criminals violent and, and you know um, more outrageous criminals in our community instead of wasting the millions of man hours chasing down high school Harry every, for that every marijuana misdemeanor arrests means three hours of police time spent not chasing murderers bank robbers and house burglars uh, we're about out of time I said earlier I like for you to call in because it's your show But remember, it's also your law and your government. The laws are what you make them, and the way you make them is through your elected representatives. But they can only do what you want if you tell them to what you want. So talk to your elected representatives. Write them a handwritten stamp letter if you can. Go visit them in their local office face-to-face -face if you can. If you can't do either of those things, telephone or write an email. But you only get as good a government as you demand. So it's up to you to tell the jokers in Austin and Washington what you expect from them. It's up to all of us. Uh, either of you have a last word you want to throw in? I, I, I would just say this. That, I mean, Buford's absolutely right. You know, I, I end one of my shows with the thought there's no truth, justice, logic, scientific fact, medical data, no reason for this drug war to exist. And it's really up to you to do your part uh, to end the madness. It's just that simple. We, we do what we can. We need you. I began to understand that the 17 or the 19 year old kid I had in the backseat of my police car was not a criminal at all. Remove the profit motive. If you remove the profit motive, you can do away with almost all these problems. And how do you do that? Simple. You end the prohibition, which can only mean one thing legalize drugs. Legalize all drugs. If we really want to improve our urban neighborhoods, The most important thing that we could do, the single most important